Good morning, judges. Today I would like to create an argument that aligns itself with the House, in which we would like to decriminalize all drug consumption. Today I will pose three main arguments, three simple arguments that show why what we are pro proposing today is the essential, paramount solution to what has been to what has been described. Our first will be on the lines of the ability for areas in the world that have the inability to have political goods to, to, to formally decriminalize drugs or to formally prohibit drugs to have such a movement in which decriminalization is further welcome. My second will be related to the economic costs of incarceration, the convolution of penal systems that results from prohibition from all drug consumption. And third, I will talk about the social stigmatization of people that are in harm while taking drugs. For my first point, in areas that don't, that don't have the capacity to enforce prohibition, such a movement towards drug consumption decriminalization should mitigate political instability and abuse of power by governments over people and racial of, of, of people of racial and socioeconomic disadvantages within the context of their country. Many of the countries today that have problems with drugs do not have the political goods to formally prohibit or to formally prosecute people that have been convicted. Most of these people that we see with the war on drugs are people that are marginalized, people that are poor, people that do not have the correct education in order to formally represent themselves in a rule of court. Therefore, we see the decriminalization of all drug consumption as a way to mitigate and better find ways to be better responsible for people that are disadvantaged. If we decriminalize all drug consumption, if someone has found drugs with, with drugs on them or to have consumed drugs, and is then tried to pro be prosecuted by someone unjustly for an abuse of power due to their political views or bias, racial bias, injustice bias, educational bias, whatever that may be, we see that a rule of court, this gives an advantage to those that have been marginalized and, and have, have disadvantages in ways of, of overcoming the unfair, just nature that they have been arrested or brought to that rule of court. The second point I'll bring today are the economic costs of incarceration and the convolution of penal systems that result from the prohibition of drug consumption. We need to eliminate private, the rule of private prisons and the role that, that stronger countries have over, over people that have dr consumed drugs in prohibited natures. It is unfair to convolute these court systems and penal systems that have other, that, one second, that will have other type, it is unfair and unjust to, to convolute penal systems that are trying to bring justice to court cases that are much more essential to the justice of our people than just consuming drugs such as marijuana. I'll take a point, please. So, so most people, most robbers are also from the lower social economic class. Can, the justi can you use the justification of convoluted courts to then decriminalize robbery now? Well, I believe the relevancy of your question is not appropriate for this measure. We're talking about consumption, we're not talking about possession. A robber is robbing the possession, they're not consuming the actual drug. To continue on with my, my point, with the economic cost of incarcerations and convolution, convolution of appeal systems for delaying justice on other malicious crimes, the economic cost of incarcerations is too high. We find that people, lost productivity, has been majorly it has been majorly delaying the progress of society and economies around the world. Econometric, econometric regressional analysis, analyses show that the lost productivity from incarcerations and then the effect of lost productivity from those that have been jailed is too high and too dis, dis, is too disruptive to societies. We believe, the House believes that a decriminalization of all drug consumption should delineate, uh, should delineate and diminish such an effect of which lost productivity from those that have been incarcerated will decrease. For my third point, and most, I would say most important point, we need to create an environment in which people that are at risk for consuming drugs feel welcomed, where if they need help, they are not facing criminal penalties. One of the biggest problems today in the war on drugs is a lack of education. It is not a matter of, of it is a matter of the fact that people do not understand what they are putting in their bodies. They don't understand the risk of certain things. They do not. They are not educated enough to make the correct decisions. They are not educated enough to get jobs that keep them out of drug dealing. They are not educated enough to fully comprehend what they are doing in their bodies. Please. Isn't it a problem if you are feeling welcome for doing something that is clearly harmful to you? In in a way, yes, but in a way, I will negate that because 
the, the, true, the true part of this is harm reduction. When people consume a drug, we're not trying to have, we're trying to create an environment in which they feel in danger, that they're able to come forward, receive the help that they need, and not feel as if they're going to be labeled as criminals. Go to almost any college in the United States and you will see a policy that which you find your roommate passed out from alcohol, you are able to, to and they're underage, you're able to basically request ambulance help without being prosecuted by the university or the state. So most importantly, to reiterate, we need people to feel welcome. We need to, if they feel welcome to receive the help that they need, we believe that harm reduction should ensue. People will not die, people will not be afraid to help people as if they are going to go, as if they are going to engage in some sort of criminal activity that is going to permanently harm their life. So with these three, with these, with these three points that I bring to you today, I believe that decriminalization on all drug consumption, not legalization, not just pure criminalization should lead to much more positive externalities among the drug realm in, in, today, in today's world. So lastly summarize, one, we need to have areas that don't have the capacity to enforce prohibition to be able to have a movement towards criminalization so that they can further get rid of the injustices that are given to marginalized and, and impoverished people around the world. These people need to have a, a, an environment in which they are not prosecuted based on the color of their skin, the education, the religious affiliation. They need to be, they, not, they cannot be the, 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 the target of such abuses by biased police officers and law enforcement that wish to find the simple possession or consumption of a, of a potentially non-malicious drug as a reason to further jail them and, and commit further injustices to them. And lastly, to lastly iterate, the economic cost of incarceration, the convoluted nature of the penal system, and the environment in which people have the right to be able to come forward and receive the correct medical health needs in a, in a situation of danger is essential to people being able to, to people being welcomed and consuming drugs in a safe way. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, on site opposition, we believe that the state should maintain a strong stance to deter people from consuming things which are obviously damaging to their body. Do we think that drugs fall within the category of dangerous objects that the state should prohibit in nature? Our policy on our side is this. We continue to criminalize drug possession and drug trafficking, we find them and put them in jail. But if they are put in jail, we believe that they will still receive drug rehabilitative services like methadone substitution therapies. We will try to heal them, we will try to kick their addiction habit. So basically, we're not just going to throw them in a dark dungeon and allow them to rot necessarily. But before, I have two arguments to you to bring forward today on this policy. So, firstly, we believe on the principle that the state should not condone the consumption of dangerous objects in our society today and drugs fall within that category. Secondly, we want to prevent an influx of people from other countries from migrating into your countries to create a drug tourism atmosphere which is essentially harmful to that particular state that implements this decriminalization measure. But before that, I have three amounts of rebuttals. The first argument that they talk about is the racial and social economic profiling. Uh, this how these uh, groups are unfairly and fairly disadvantaged. <coughs> but that is essentially not the problem. Uh, decriminalization is not the cause of all this discrimination. The cause of this discrimination can be better managed through better policies that prevent racial profiling, giving them state lawyers, for example, to defend them in court. These are policies which the state can remedy at hand. It's not an inherent cause of decriminalization. Better policies can tackle this. But then that is not really an argument towards decriminalizing drugs, right? Because essentially the argument that I, the POI that I gave, many people from the lower socioeconomic classes are the majority of people who commit theft, people who commit robbery. Are you saying that just because the penal because the penal system is complicated, because the courts cannot maintain this kind of incarceration is the reason to now decriminalize all robbery, to decriminalize all theft necessarily? That's not a justification. Do the state should be deterred to say that if you did something wrong, then you better well face the consequences of it. You shouldn't be dilly to say that, oh, there's too many people in the court system, I can now wash my hands off these people necessarily. Before I move on, yes. Um, so are you saying that drug users cause as much harm to society as, uh, let's say, a robber exactly. and, and, and that, that they would have as many negative impacts on Yes, society? they have many, many negative impacts on society, which I explained in my first principle argument here. But uh, move, on, move on to my second example. They talk about the economic cost of the penal system. 
We say that under our proposal, harm reduction measures that are available in prison can heal these people and can make them turn their lives into better people. But we think that the idea that the deterrence of, decrim of criminalization must still be there because essentially you are sending a message to a huge majority of people to prevent them from taking drugs in the first place, to prevent them from sucking and leeching off the healthcare system that you are so concerned about necessarily. Because essentially, if you allow mass consumption of drugs, you need a lot of money to heal these people, you need a lot of money to put them to undergo rehabilitation programs, the financial Incur, the, thing, the financial things that you incur under your side is even more heavy if you decriminalize it necessarily. Thirdly, we talk about social stigmatization. We say it's good. Stigmatization is the very reason to prevent people from committing crime in the first place. The very fact that you'll be alienated, the very fact that necessarily you will face unintended consequences, the deterrent that prevent people from committing robbery, whether people committing rape necessarily. We believe on the utilitarian perspective that to be willing to bite the bullet to say that social stigmatization is the one that can prevent the slippery slope of people from huge consumption of drugs in the future. Let's move on to my first point. But before that, I just want to point out. Are you going to be willing to legalize, for example, drugs which are like crocodile, which eats on the human's flesh necessarily? Things like crack cocaine, which are unprocessed, which are unpure, that have many negative consequences that can cause death necessarily. These are things, there are certain drugs which are necessarily extremely harmful. Are you still going to decriminalize it? Because if the drugs here that you're talking about are not only marijuana, but there are also many other more harmful drugs. Let's look at my first point. Why state shouldn't condone the consumption of dangerous objects? For all the rhetoric that we hear as a speaker, drugs essentially are still harmful. Cocaine can cause long-term psychosis, tremors and heart failure. Marijuana, even though it might be for recreational measures, it creates a rapid heart rate, there's memory loss, there's long-term cognitive problems in the future. And these are scientifically proven ways. We think that even consumption of cocaine itself is also very problematic. Because this is, it doesn't cause addiction in the long term. Because if you overconsume it, you will necessarily die. In the, in, 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 there's a possibility that you will face the death in, in, in this instance. So essentially, it's a harmful thing to do. The social contract signed between the individual and the state allows the state to step in to prevent harm to a society. And liberty, your liberty, stops when you, you consume things that harm yourself or you do things that cause harms to yourself. For example, you might say you have the liberty to not wear seatbelts because it's fun, because it's cool, but the state can step in and force you to wear seatbelts, can punish you if you don't wear seatbelts, because your liberty is only limited insofar as you do not cause harm to yourself. And we believe that drugs essentially here cause harm to yourself. We think in many cases, in many even liberal democratic countries like the UK, have already gone through this pathway to decriminalize and to not condone consumption of bad Things. For example, in the UK, they already disallow people who are born after 2000 to consume tobacco necessarily. Countries like Australia already stripped down advertisements, already put high taxation towards, that, towards tobacco necessarily. So there is already a trend for state to clamp down on individual rights if it means saving more life, if it means providing better health services to the people necessarily. But also in the second idea, the impacts of people from other countries. Because proposition never set this debate in any context. We believe that if you want one country decriminalizes drugs, you necessarily cause an influx and it attracts it attracts many countries and many citizens from other countries to go into your country to consume drugs there, and there will be more problems will arise here. Security problems for people who consume drugs, who uh, go into a hallucination, who maybe commit robbery, commit theft under the influences of drugs. People who are in these countries who need to go through your harm reduction and your health services which cause a strain towards the state necessarily in the end of the day. It sucks your budget away. The fact that the European Union and ASEAN all have open border migration makes and proliferates this problem even more. People will necessarily go to these particular countries, consume drugs there and the problem will exacerbate within these countries. This is why decriminalization is a deterrent. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So today I will be extending upon my partner's arguments. I'll, I'll be running from the main points raised by the proposition, uh, opposition, and I'll be introducing some arguments of my own. So um, basically, I would like to reinforce that we would like to decriminalize all drug consumption, 
for the reasons that um, Aaron already mentioned before, which are that um, that the current stance has given lots of economic costs, that it has created an atmosphere like a stigma, which has been worse for drug users, and it has created an environment where people feel like they do not, they can't receive the right care. So um, I'd like to go into rebutting some of the arg arguments raised by the opposition. So first, that um, that allowing drug consumption would lead to the slippery slope of drugs. This is not always the case, and it, it is not true that by allowing cannabis, they, that would necessarily mean that people would delve into harder drugs. Secondly, um, they said that by providing treatment within prisons, that this would save more lives and encourage public health. And yet this has shown not be the case. Actually, the problem with prohibition is that it has led to tens of thousands of losses of lives. Um, it, it, public health is the, is the least priority uh, within this framework. And uh, it is not the best way to respond to this problem. And we do recognize that this is a problem. Yes. So how can you make the slippery slope argument that the motion itself says that you will decriminalize all drugs? Yes, no, what I'm saying is that you raised that um, by decriminalizing all drugs, you're letting people go down the slippery slope where if they're allowed one drug, then they'll necessarily take more drugs. But then the fact of the matter is that majority of drug users are not problematic drug users. They're, um, it's a small minority where they have dependencies or addictions. There are certain drug users who are also not recreational drug users who are hardcore addicts, but you also decriminalize them and do not punish them. Yes, well, this is a, first of all, this is a small minority of all drug users. Secondly, we believe that it is not in the government's position. It is not in the prison, like the federal justice system or the criminal justice system's uh, place to be able to respond to these harms because these are very real, legitimate harms and they are not being adequately responded to by the criminal justice system or prohibitionist systems as it is. So um, this is an urgent problem that needs addressing and, and it, this, it, what you're like, um, the prohibitionist stance that you are promulgating is not the answer, we believe, because it has led to unheard of uh, human rights abuses, um, uh, um, arrest of minors in some countries, um, death, loss of livelihood, um, like high prevalence in HIV among injecting drug users. These are answer. These are problems that the current system is not able to face. Um, secondly, you. Um, you raised the point about drug tourism being a fear. This has not necessarily been realized in some of the cases, such as in um, in in Western Europe, in in Portugal. This this not necessarily be a fearful fear because a lot of the fears that were associated with decriminalizing in Portugal were not realized. It actually led to better results. It, it led to a uh, reduction in problematic drug use. And thirdly, you said that. The better solution would be to offer rehabilitation services in prison. Sorry, um, this is not the best place to do this because recidiv recidivism rates would low rise. This is where people will learn, likely learn more crimes and commit more crimes when they're released, and they won't have access to jobs or opportunities or a chance to rebuild themselves. So um, I would like to extend my own argument, which is that the current approach to the drug problem is not working. We have all these negative externalities that are just unheard of, um, inhum inhumane, and uh, grave abuses of human rights, lots of health problems, deaths, widespread deaths. Sorry, yes. Um, and so th there's an urgent need to correct this, and we think de decriminalizing is the way to do this, especially since drug consumption, we feel, causes more harm to the user than to society. Um, so that we would really like to minimize the negative impacts of drug consumption, and we feel like decriminalization, decriminalization of drug consumption is the way to do that. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Are you going to decriminalize dangerous drugs like crocodile and hardcore cocaine? Yes, decriminalize possession consumption of all drugs because we feel that public health services um, are the better way to respond to these problems, not the justice system, not the criminal justice system. 
we, the criminal justice system actually makes this worse. We want to advocate for a harm reduction approach, you know, capacity building of um, some society groups which might better address these cares. They could better target the minorities which have been detrimentally affected by this response. Um, what's this? So we would, yeah, we would like to decriminalize it. We would like to advocate for a harm reduction approach by facilitating the capacity building of civil society organization groups, for instance, um, allowing for alternative treatment that people could could use. Um, we're not condoning the, the sale or trafficking of drugs, as these continue to be illegal, and, and um, sale to minors continue to be a criminal offense, but it's consumption that we say is not, uh, no longer, it's not within the realm of the criminal justice system to deal with this problem adequately. So uh, to summarize, we have said that the current um, the current response to the drug problem is not working, has led to many negative externalities. Secondly, that um, drug use causes more harm to the user than to society, and it is not within the realm of the criminal justice system to be able to address these problems. So lastly, that we would like to minimize the negative impacts of drug consumption, and we feel that decriminalization of all drug consumption is the way to do this. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something about what crocodile does. It makes your skin have green scales. It makes them fall out. It makes, it makes the muscles in your body visible when they, these things fall out. And this is where my rebuttals to the proposition argument begin, that they are talking about legalizing, no, decriminalizing all these drugs. What they are talking about is the government sending out a message that doing these drugs is okay, causing so much harm to yourself is okay. We are totally against this proposition. There are also synthetic drugs these days, such as spice, which is a variant of uh, cannabis, uh, which, which looks like cannabis, which looks like marijuana, but has many, many more serious effects. It, it, gives, it might send some people into a coma. So we are not for decriminalizing drugs such, that are so dangerous. Then they talk about that, uh, that only a small minority is addicted to drugs and has a serious problem with drugs. We think that this small minor minority is serious enough for us to criminalize drug use for everyone. They also talk about, they also talk about uh, the criminal justice response not being the correct one for drug use and drug consumption. Well, 56% of the crime in the United Kingdom is committed by drug users. If, if drug use is so closely linked to crime, the response ought to be a criminal justice one, not a public health one. They talk about HIV prevention. Well, if you have rehabilitation in prison, it provides deterrence with HIV pre prevention. Thank you, I'll take that later. Uh, they say that uh, in certain countries, drug tourism hasn't really happened, but it has happened in Netherlands, and it is very likely to happen in countries that are surrounded by countries that have very serious drug laws. They talk about how uh, poor people are discriminated against in the war on drugs. Well, it is the responsibility of the government to prevent poor people from harming themselves because poor people face more serious consequences of addiction. They have to resort to crime to fuel their addiction. Therefore, it is the responsibility of the government to make a, create an environment in which they are not addicted to substances that are so harmful that they make them resort to crime to fuel it. Okay, so um, you said that the government should respond to that, but then uh, that, that would be able to respond to the, the right problem with minorities. But then, if it hasn't responded to that problem adequately in the past, how do you propose that it would now? Well, it should. That's what we're talking about. What that should the government do? The government governments haven't haven't decriminalized drugs yet. Doesn't mean that they shouldn't do it. So this is a better response to the drug problem than decriminalizing drugs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will make two arguments why decriminalizing all drugs is a bad bad thing. Firstly. I will talk about how decriminalization will increase e drug use. Secondly, I will talk about how criminal networks will be strengthened by the decriminalization of all drugs. The usage of hard drugs in Portugal increased when 
uh, the, all drugs were decriminalized in Portugal. In 2001, there was a survey in Australia in which 91% of young people said that they would uh, use cannabis if it were decriminalized. In na 1998, Netherlands had the third highest cannabis and cocaine use in Europe. Can Netherlands has also become a hub for creating synthetic drugs and also marijuana with very high THC levels and exporting them to other countries. This is what decriminalization of drugs has done, of even soft drugs. Um, when you say that the case in Portugal is in, in favor of decriminalization because overall problematic drug use actually decreased in the case of Portugal, but the in initial drug use rose, the <coughs> overall problematic drug use declined. So. But where well, the use of hard drugs has increased and we need to uh, wait for more data to see if if the long-term consequences of hard drugs, because because generally the consequences of using hard drugs manifest themselves in the long term. So we should see if if that is uh, the case in Portugal. Sorry, I will take that um, Also, the criminalization of drug use till today has kept drug use low. So the, at least in OECD countries, the use of tobacco is 60% of the population. The use of alcohol is 90% of the population, while the use of illicit hard drugs is below 1% of the population. Therefore, we can argue that uh, criminalizing drug use has kept drug use low, and this is a good thing. Sweden and Netherlands have very different drug policies. Sweden has a prohibitionist stance, while the Netherlands has a, has a liberal stance towards drugs. Although Sweden and Netherlands have the same level of drug use, but it is important to realize that Sweden brought down drug use from the highest, one of the highest levels in Europe, to the lowest today. And Netherlands has not had that measure of success. So these are my arguments. Firstly, we have rebutted their arguments about about all drugs being okay to consume, about uh, a small minority facing the most most charges, and about. HIV and harm reduction measures. We also think that harm reduction is also quite as costly as incarceration and it is a very roundabout way of going about it. So firstly, you let people get addicted, then you reduce the addiction, then you reduce the harm caused by addiction. Better than that is to not let people get addicted. Yes. Could you please elaborate um, with harm reduction is more cost of incarceration? Are you saying financially, politically, ethically, or socially? Financially, I'm saying it is financially more, uh, financially quite as uh, costly as as incarceration, because you have to provide them with medical services, you have to provide them with needles and syringes and so on. Okay, so we have also rebutted that uh, about the about drug tourism and how it is quite likely in some countries for there to be drug tourism. For example, in Netherlands, we have also made the argument that. Uh, drug decriminalizing drug use will increase drug use and that it will strengthen the criminal networks uh, because the motion says that you will decriminalize drug consumption you will not decriminalize drug sale you will not decriminalize drug production so that leaves the market open to the criminal networks for supply that and that it reduces the disincentives for their clients to commit drugs and that makes the criminal network stronger because it gives them a bigger clientele, a more confident clientele. So those are arguments that, that decriminalizing drug use will increase drug use and that criminal networks will be strengthened. Thank you. Good morning once again, judges. I will first offer solutions or answers to your two questions today. I will then provide a short rebuttal of what the opposition has said, and then we'll then summarize once again our response to the motion at hand. The first question you asked, the justice system and the social systems mutually exclusive within our argument? The answer is no, they are not. They work with each other to benefit each other, and they reinforce each other in ways that they need to be, they need to be defined as not mutually exclusive. In areas where the justice system is corrupt, it becomes the right of the people, the educated people in societies, to provide the correct education and provide the correct recommendations for people to become responsible with their bodies. So second question, why not just legalization? We are not ready to legalize all drugs yet. Communities around the world are not epistemic enough to understand what, to, to fully comprehend, and for the world to fully comprehend, what will happen within these cultures of such a dramatic decision is created. 
It needs to be incremental. Emotion is quick, analysis is slow. We need to learn that first we need to decriminalize and we first need to experiment and see how people in certain cultures react. Then we will have the necessary data, with the necessary evidence, with the necessary ability to make a efficient and effective policy recommendation that will firmly input legalization within such societies. To, last, to now summarize and review some of what the opposition has said. The opposition said, sucks your budget away. That's what, that's what such uh, prisons do in, in a myriad of ways. Sucks your budget away, how? As how does this suck your budget away when it costs incredible amounts of money to keep people incarcerated? And further after that, it sucks budget away from taxable income that such people cannot obtain when they leave because they don't have the marketable skills nor the ability to receive a job that actually inhibits them to be, that actually does not inhibit them, but allows them to become functional members of society. Prison systems, you said, offer uh, help addicts where, where other help does not exist. Where are these prisons? Go down to South Africa, go down to these areas where people are raped, they're gang raped, they are, they are absolutely, they're, they're beaten, they're even inputted with HIV infectious diseases from other inmates in those prisons that feel that it's their obligation to enforce their views, their gang views, on people that may have just smoked marijuana. Why do those people deserve such a penalty? You said hardcore addicts are, are criminals. Being an addict is not a, is not a crime for using a drug. Being a criminal is committing a crime. Acts are not criminals, they're just people that need help. So lastly, to summarize what we have said today, we have said to reaffirm, we did not agree with drug consumption. We just said it has to be decriminalized. We need to take the steps correctly as a society to build systems that welcome and allow people to become educated. We need to promulgate trust within societies. Prohibition just says you cannot do something to your own body. It, it does not promulgate any sort of any sort of affectation in which people think that this is bad for them or they should be not allowed to do such things to their own bodies. We believe with right education, if we decriminalize, so if we decriminalize all drugs, we have the ability to create societies that use them in efficient, effective, and safe ways. We already have a myriad of drugs that are legal, which people, which people do not abuse necessarily, but use for the righteous being of certain medical and medicinal and also recreational usages. Why should we, why does the state or the house have the right to take away such things? Marijuana is much of a chemical. There are certain drugs that you've said that are incredibly harmful to the body. We believe that this does exist, but once again, I would like to reaffirm that you know, with the right education, the right opportunities, and the lack, and, and the end of marginalization to people who do not actually deserve to be in prisons, societies will have the ability to build systems in which they can create ways that people are able to use such drugs responsibly. We can no longer judge these societies. We need to give them the ability to be trusted. We need to give them the ability to be educated. So I'd like to lastly just one last time reaffirm the importance that the House says on the decriminalization of all drugs across the board. We are not, once again, I'd like to reaffirm, we did not say we agree with drug consumption. We are just saying that we need to decriminalize drug consumption so that we can create gateways to a more just society, okay. thus ending the drug wars. Thank you. So on the first question, on the criminal justice framework, I understand that the question here is why not we decriminalize so that people don't face stigmatization, so that they go to health services voluntarily. But essentially public policy is not only about the plight of individual users. It must not be viewed as a vacuum. It must be weighed with the complications of debt to the society as a whole. If you destigmatize drug consumption, then you allow the gateway, you open the doors, you tell the people that it's okay to consume drugs, that you'll be less stigmatized by society. The society views it's okay to consume crocodile, that it's okay to consume this kind of drug therapies essentially. That sense of bad match society. We are willing to say that yes, these stigmatization is something that we cannot avoid under our policy. 
but that's something that we are willing to take if that benefits the majority of society as a whole. If the state is consistent in its principle to say that all forms of drugs are essentially bad for you and you should not consume it. And stigmatization is the exact weapon to tackle into the minds of all society that this is something that is bad. And that's a deterrent message to society. We think that on the second level, on the individual liberty, how far can state push? The question posed to us is this, should we then ban alcohol and tobacco? Well, honestly, if we could reverse time back to 1960s and 1950s, if, the, if this is the defining moment in time where a leader can decide whether tobacco can be proliferating in our society, I would say that the leader shouldn't allow tobacco to proliferate in society. And that is a trend that even the most liberal democratic countries like the UK and Australia have been pushing, pushing tobacco companies like Marlboro away from the fringes of society because they recognize that tobacco, whatever recreational rhetoric that people like to play in the media, is essentially harmful to people in the end of the day. Your individual liberty can only go as far as what the state can prevent you from consuming something that is inherently dangerous. And we believe that drugs, because of the nature that if you overconsume, you might die, that there are unintended side effects that can, that can affect your psychomotor skills and your ability to function as a normal member of society, is precisely the harms that the state can come in and clamp down and to say, no, your individual liberty stops there if you harm yourself. And we believe in this case, you also harm others. You harm your family members who have to pay for your addiction. You harm society as a whole who is will consume drugs and become lesser functioning members of society but the country as a whole in its human workforce necessarily drops because of drug consumption. We see this happening in Afghanistan, Pakistan and many European countries. The consumption and addiction of drugs is so severe that the overall human productivity is jeopardized. And we do not want to open that doors towards many other countries at hand. And that's the exclusive benefit of our policy deterrence. The third idea is this the fringe disadvantages that will happen in decriminalization. We talk about how criminal networks will proliferate simply because you haven't reached a step of legalization. The people, is there's a huge demand market there simply because people are not afraid to consume because there will, there will be no deterrence and no penalty. That's where the black market can tag into these countries and that's there where they will proliferate, that's where gang violence, that's where drug violence happens. That is bad. We also talk about drug tourism. The fact that necessarily because of the open border policies that are so prevalent in many countries today, people are able to travel into your country to cause problems there simply because you decriminalize. And who is going to pay the bills for all these people? Who's going to pay the bills for all the security and harms that these this foreign tourists come to your country to do? Who's going to put the bill for these foreign people who need your health, sub, sub health substitution therapies that you talk about? The people are going to foot the bill. So if you are talking about a cost benefit financial analysis, our side is better because we essentially cut the problem from the butt. We prevent people from normalizing drug use in the first place so that, so that they don't even need to go to the hospitals to undergo your harm substitution therapies in the very first place. So if you really want to take care of your coppers and your pockets and your monies, then necessarily our policy of decriminalization in the long term is better. We are proud of the goals. Thank you very much.